because you have the air coming in and going down and going up in an exhaust pipe. Do you remember why we want a net on top of the exhaust pipe? So flies get low. Right. You know, talk about how it's important to have a latrine clean. And and I don't know, we, I was, a lot of latrines smell, and I just don't understand. They all have ash. They all burn charcoal. And so we encourage them to throw ash in their latrine. I don't know if we have any luck doing that. but it, I don't know. It stops the smell. It, 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 it turns into uh, lye and it just it destroys it. Yeah, yeah it's lye. And, uh, it's it, you can use it for making soap. Yeah, we, um, we, that, we used to do it all the time. And, uh, in, uh, on the next page, I'm just kind of galloping through here. The top is a tippy tap, and that's also you can Google how to make a tippy tap. It's uh, a way to have a, a wash area for, yeah, it, it works pretty good. Okay, the next page, okay, who knows how long you're supposed to wash your hands in soap? 20 seconds. How do you know that? 30. You go to third grade. 20, yeah, 20 seconds. Oh, and and our well, nurse here wants me to tell you that you need. Well, he said he says you need to take off your jewelry, but just for hand washing for food or something. I don't know. So, but you want to make sure that you get between your finger your fingers, your nails, your wrists, and twenty seconds is quite a long time. Each table make a hand washing song. That is 20 seconds long. And you're going to sing it to the rest of us. Hey, do we have a volunteer group? 
You want to start it? What? Go, yeah. Now, three. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. If you're happy and it's a funeral march. Rip, the Rip could have stole our song. <laughs> they must have overheard it. They must have. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. Scrub, scrub, scrub. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. Scrub, scrub, scrub. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Scrub, scrub. Close. About 18 minutes. Seconds. 18 seconds. It felt like it. Wash your hands, rub them clean, take off all your jewelry bands. Wash your hands, rub them clean, take off all your jewelry bands. <laughs> Scrub them, scrub them, scrub them, and now you're ready to eat. And again. Wash, wash, wash your hands until you are clean. Scrub them, scrub them, scrub them, scrub them, and now you're ready to eat. That's good. How long was that? It was about 20 Okay. Just, just a small, a small point of information is a lot of places they think they're being really healthy and stuff because they have an air blower that you dry your hands. Actually, it's the wiping with a towel that gets rid of the final germs. The towel, uh, the white condition on this individual, and them still. Because when you wipe off the germs with the towel, the germs sit on the towel. Yeah. And we are uh, talking here about one country. Uh, it's not freezing there, and, uh, and that always a good criterion to check the cleanliness of uh, washcloths and towels is just for snow. Yeah, when right. Snow and there's germs on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Well, our discussion is supposed to be an easy uh, solution. Yeah. The main thing still, and I go back to the lesson from the epidemiologist uh, on Ebola two three months ago. Olympia, he said thorough washing and air drying. If it's, it's your personal towel. It's, yeah. it's one of the like handles, handles, faucets, soap bars, and uh, towels, and handshakes. Yeah. Handshakes are the uh, most. Yeah. Uh, Frequently, most frequently used bridges. Yeah. Okay, and we're supposed to key in on how about doing business in uh, in our environments that we've been in. And uh, Wayne, do you want to contribute a little bit about what you found uh, 
trying to work in uh, Uganda and Burundi and whatever you ran into in India? Well, come on up here. We'll just, uh, I know that there's quite a difference between the, all three of them, that basically. So I, I don't know if I'm really qualified to uh, address this too much. Uh, most of you have done more world traveling than I have, but uh, and my experience has been somewhat sequestered. Uh, um, the training we did in northern Uganda was through a, a Catholic missionary out of Denver, and uh, during that week-long training we were given time to teach the biosand filter class and we set up um, we, we set up people that were we thought could manage that that and and carry the, on the business um, in Rituvo Burundi we actually elected officers to a co-op that could could address uh, both uh, a working business in Rituvo and Bujumbura. Um, but I, to my knowledge, I don't think either one of those places has actually done much of anything. I know in Burundi it was real difficult for them to seek government uh, licensing to actually produce the filters. That, yeah. that was their complaint anyway. Okay. So, so when you are saying you want to small business, they have to get to the ministry and get some kind of licensing? Um, the, most generally, you don't because these are NGO uh, projects and you're flying under the radar of the government anyway. So uh, they don't uh, pay much attention to you unless uh, you really do something grossly wrong or you're very successful. And uh, so uh, if you uh, are very successful, they're right there to take credit for it. And uh, the politicians love it. And that's why when we uh, begin a program, uh, do a kickoff, we um, generally have uh, members of the government uh, attending and they can see how wonderful it is and then they can tell out what everyone what a wonderful job they've done and uh, so uh, so you let them play the game you know their game as far as that's concerned and like I said uh, no problem yet the only difficult was difficulty in Uganda Uganda is much more of a police state than, than Kenya is, in that uh, they like to know everything that's going on. How come there's a group of people, more than five or six people here? And things like that. So if they, they're comfortable, you don't have to do anything. But if they're uncomfortable, you've got questions to answer. Well, that, that was uh, actually the case in Rutugo, Burundi. Uh, uh, the couple that we went with from Everett, Washington, were very clear that they got out to see the mayor of the town to to basically ask his blessing because he thought that if we started anything we would immediately be shut down before we even got started. Robin. So um, one of the things that I'd like to mention that I one of our challenges I think was that they wound up choosing the guy from Bujumbura to be the lead in both the project in the country and in the city. Now I would actually suggest that you know three a three hour drive on bumpy roads in one of those countries is not good to have your lead person that far away. They really should have chosen a, a lead in the village also. Yeah, you're right. And, and one of the things that in doing business over there, uh, people really find this out because, uh, like for pump projects, uh, these don't take a very many don't take very many people to be involved in it. Like a water filter project, you set up an organization and you've got a, uh, a way of controlling.
controlling things like that. But uh, many times uh, people have gone in to do a project and the guy that was there helping them all the time, they said, well, put him in charge. He's the one that knows everything about this, but he might be totally out of it as far as the community is concerned. His relationship to the people may not be, be good. And uh, he may do that every time an NGO shows up that takes, happens to get more money than anybody else. And uh, so let the community be involved with who's going to be in charge of things like that. If you have a situation where uh, there is an in charge issue, So in, when we did a training in North India, the, the government decided this was a really good thing. And they had a giant ceremony with many reporters and lots of people gathered for an audience so that I could sign together with other folks in agreement with the government that they were going to produce 16 million bio sand filters. 16 million. 16 million in, in, in five years. And of course, they haven't produced a single one, and I knew they weren't going to produce a single one, and that was just fine. Um, uh, the important part, the important thing that happened was, so everybody was sort of sitting around at this table for photo ops and whatever, but the biggest photo op is I had my half-size filter with me, and I took dirty water from the Ganga and poured it in and drank it. And the faces went, and the minister, we have pictures in the paper, the minister going, you know, <laughs> kind of like that. And, and uh, the, the, the fact that the Muzungu or in India, the Ferengi in Ethiopia or whatever, but the, the, the pinky gray faced person would use the water was um, particularly uh, important. Um, when I worked with programs, we don't assume that the government any either local or state or federal governments will ever go forward with their promises. If they do, it's great. We've got terrific cooperation, in particular in Rwanda, with the local government, not with the federal government, um, who've been supplying us with space and food and all kinds of fun stuff, and now are ordering filters themselves. Um, but we kind of have to assume, you know, benign neglect is just fine. Okay. Um. <laughs> One of our misconceptions uh, when we first went to Kenya was that people knew how to market. And we thought, well, they grow things and they sell them, so they must know how to do this. But they like grow tomatoes and they take it to the edge of the road and they sit there and they may or may not make an attractive arrangement that's kind of the more advanced is balancing the tomatoes and having the best sides out but nobody really markets you just sit by the side of the road and you visit with your neighbor and maybe you trade food before you go home and they're selling the same thing you are yeah so We've literally had marketing classes where we talk about, you know, creating a need and then filling the need and, and that kind of just simple marketing things. And so um, that was an important step that we didn't know about when we first started. Now in our trainings, we talk more about marketing and how to do it and who's going to be their salespeople and stuff like that. What's interesting is that Safaricom was the largest uh, communications company in Kenya. Um, they advertise all the time on everything. They paint buildings. They paint their name on everything. They make sure that they, you've got uh, uh, um, just many amenities and, and they've got uh, a contest going on, things like this. And uh, People don't even recognize this as advertising and as promotion. They just, they're just, they're not, they're rather naive about marketing. So, uh, I, in our conference as well, uh, we talk about 
different kinds of advertising, and and uh, Safaricom doesn't even come up. Uh, they don't recognize it. So then I get back and talking to them. Now, now you're getting bombarded every day from one company that paints buildings green. And finally, they'll think, oh, Safaricom does that. Well, why do they do that? You know, and they finally have to get to the understanding that this is advertising, and that's what you have to do if you want to promote your project. But you don't have to do it to the extent that Safaricom does. Just go out, shake hands, meet people, and talk with them, and show them what you have. You know, it's just a, a very just be well. Yeah, yeah, and just be well, right? And uh, but um, these are these are things that uh, we have to, uh, if we want a successful project, for people to understand that uh, there's more to it than just sitting by the roadside and waiting for somebody to buy. Yes. Susan, you just said just be well. I was just thinking that if you have a neighborhood neighbors, yeah. so one family has the yes. other, and it, it, that must promote itself in your family. Yes, it does. It does, right. Yeah, and that's one important part about getting more saturation into a market area, and that uh, suddenly nearly everybody's well, but how come my family isn't? And then, well, this is all it takes, you know. I think we need to start keeping better track and, of um, different ways um, groups start in their marketing strategies. But we've talked a lot about Jean Smith, but what she's done is, is um, she starts groups of mostly widows and they make uh, clothes. And I actually have some of her clothes for sale. And, and then they take, uh, when they, she sells most of the things in the States. But a third of the money goes to the person that sold it. A third of the money goes to um, re, re, um, buy more material. And a third of the money goes to the co-op. And then the co-op itself can decide how, if they want to um, buy goats or chickens or how they want to spend their money. And so Jean had a biocide water filter in her house. And she decided that water really was good. And the, so then she started restoring springs, and like she has the knowledge, but obviously she's an older lady, and she can't like dig and stuff. The community has to help um, restore the spring, and then she puts a biosand water filter in a widow's house near the spring with the agreement that that widow will take care of it, and everyone can use it. So now people in the community really want biosand water filters, and. She's writing proposals to Friendly Water that we do trainings with those widows groups and then they will sell the filters. So that's a completely new way of, of doing business, but it's just interesting how, um, you know, if you just sort of relax and sit back, ways come into being. So, but Dell needs to tell you about a whole thing where a whole village is, is getting biosand water filters, a thousand homes and uh, this is a, 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 again a completely different plan and it, it's now completely different than our original plan but that's the way things flow anyway um there's no magic there's no one way to do anything you know when i was raising foster kids i was always looking for the one thing that would make it easy <laughs> there's no magic wand <laughs> we just talked a little bit about latrines and in the cost website there's a whole notebook on how to build latrines i have taken that training and i know more about latrines than i want to know but if you if you want to discuss some different floors for latrines i um a domed floor works really well and doesn't need reinforcement 